the night wind howls in the chimney cowls and the bat in the moonlight flies and inky clouds like funeral shrouds sail over the midnight skies when the footpads quail at the night birds wail and the black dogs bay at the moon this is the specter's holiday then is the ghost high noon for then is the ghost high noon I noon. This is the ghost's high noon. <laughs> Petri Wine brings you. Red-Throated League and another spine-tingling adventure of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And now, once again, we turn in at a familiar gate. The wind whistles cold and sharp through empty branches. A brilliant October moon peers intermittently from behind scudding clouds. Hello, what's that in the good doctor's window? A pumpkin lantern. Dr. Watson is celebrating Halloween early this year. Oh, come in, Mr. Harris, uh, come in. Why are you delaying on the doorstep? Well, I was just admiring your Halloween decorations, Dr. Watson. <laughs> A work of art, isn't it? Uh, presented to me this afternoon by my youngest godchild. It's supposed to ward off goblins and witches and other nefarious familiars who are abroad this time of the year. <laughs> you mean who are supposed to be abroad? Oh, not necessarily, Mr. Harris. Not necessarily. Now, here, take this chair by the fire. Thank you. Uh, did I ever tell you of the time Holmes and I had a rather terrifying encounter with a notorious laughing lemur of Hightower Heath? Oh, you no, know you didn't. Uh, who was that? Well, a witch. A witch who had been buried centuries before on a wild and brooding countryside known as Dartmoor. This adventure took place on All Saints' Eve, uh, the particular witch's Sabbath, which you Americans refer to as <coughs> Halloween. Uh, but there I go, off the deep end as usual. Uh, suppose I pause to pour at each a glass of uh, Petri Sherry. Uh, uh, you may uh, wish to pay homage to that very generous gentleman, our sponsor. Ah, uh, of course. I can't be as entertaining as Dr. Watson, but I can tell you something that really is worth knowing. Simply this, the best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the perfect before dinner wine. While you're waiting for dinner to be put on the table, pour yourself a glass of that clear amber-colored Petri Sherry. Now just sit back and sip it slowly. Take your time so you can thoroughly enjoy every single drop of that wonderful Petri flavor. And now to return to the witch on the moor. Oh, right oh. Uh, but first I think I'd, uh, I'd turn off the lights. <laughs> this is a story that is best told by the eerie flicker of a goblin lantern, such as the one my godchild so obligingly supplied for the occasion. Hmm. I'll say it's eerie, Dr. Watson. I'm beginning to have shivers up and down my spine already. Oh, better draw closer to the fire then, because there's more to come. Uh, the story begins cheerfully enough. It was one morning several years after my marriage, a brilliant fall day, the last day of October to be exact. Mary and I had just finished our early morning fin in Hattie uh, when a violent jangle at the front doorbell heralded a, a telegram from my erstwhile partner in crime, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As nearly as I can remember, it ran, <clears throat> if uh, convenient, meet me Paddington Station uh, 15, uh, if convenient, uh, inconvenient, come anyway. Bring service revolver. Don't suppose you have any silver bullets. Silver bullets? 
What was the meaning of that inquiry, Dr. Watson? As a matter of fact, that was my first question after Holmes had settled himself in the corner of our first class railway carriage. His sharp, eager face, framed in his ear flap traveling cap, peered earnestly out of the window as though he had failed to hear my question. Our present rate of speed, Watson, is 53 and one half miles per hour. Oh, well, I can't say I've noticed the quarter mile markers. Nor have I. But the telegraph posts along this line are exactly 60 yards apart. Hence, the calculation is a simple one. Did you ask me something? <laughs> you know, Dash, well, I did. I gathered from your telegram that we are about to embark on another investigation. A dangerous one, judging from the fact that you wished me to bring my revolver. But why this facetious inquiry as to the silver bullets? Because it is a common superstition among the natives of the moors of Devonshire that the evil spirits who abound there can only be killed by a silver bullet. Who is interested in native superstitions? We are, Watson. We have been urgently summoned by Sir Lionel Fenwick of Fenwick Hall because a long dead ancestress of his is supposed to be on the prowl. It seems she's not only playing all sorts of outrageous pranks, but actually threatening the safety of his infant son, born only two weeks ago. In other words, Watson, we are not on the trail of a common criminal. This is a witch hunt. And try as I might, Mr. Harris, that was the last bit of information I could get out of Holmes. He enfolded himself in his voluminous Inverness and quietly went off to sleep in his corner. It was after sundown when he awakened. A gash of primitive red streak in the western sky. The green squares of the English fields and the low curve of autumn woods had given way to a gray and melancholy landscape. In the distance rose a strange, jagged peak with the desolate ruins of a single Roman watchtower rising from its summit. It was like some fantastic landscape in a bad dream. Depressing, eh, Watson? The first glimpse of the moor. We shall be there shortly. Better put on your overcoat. <laughs> I've already got it on. <laughs> Had it on for the last hour. It's turned beastly cold. Mm, yes, so it has. Notice that ancient Roman tower, Watson. She's buried at the crossroads at the foot of that hill. It's from that building that she derives her name. Who derives what name? The Laughing Lemur of High Tower Hill. A lemur is the Roman word for ghost or spirit of the dead. But she was a witch besides. That's why she was buried at the crossroads. She should have been burned, of course, and her ashes scattered to the four winds, except that she was a great lady and married to the head of the house of Fenwick, whose given name was Hugo. Hugo was an old boy in his 60s when he married her. He'd had two previous wives, both of whom died childless. Now, Hugo was a determined old codger he decided to have another try. Much to the annoyance of his brother Edgar, he imported a lusty, fun-loving young French noblewoman, uh, a Louise de Lombard, whose mother was the notorious Madame de Montespan. Madame de Montespan, well, well, wasn't she some sort of a, a minor Borgia, uh, dealt in poisons and love potions and the like? Yes, Watson, she also dabbled in witchcraft for which she was eventually tried. At any rate, Louise seemed young and gay and exceptionally healthy and active, too active perhaps for her ancient bridegroom. <laughs> she insisted he accompany her when she rode to Hans. In due course of time, he was found, his neck broken on the far side of a particularly high wall, which his wife had taken a few minutes before amidst shrieks of laughter. <laughs> Louise was famous for her laughter, 
and her husband's untimely death does not seem to have silenced it. Accompanied by the retinue of a half a dozen women and half a dozen men, she had brought with her from France, she rode day by and danced by night, and day or night, she continued to laugh. <laughs> Dash it, bad taste if you ask me. Quite. At first, her brother-in-law, Edgar, seemed to have been fairly tolerant of the situation, since he now believed himself lord of the manor. But one day, three weeks after her husband's death, Louise came to him and informed him she was going to have a child. The dead Hugo was to have an heir. And she relayed the information midst gales of laughter. <laughs> Poor Edgar. <laughs> The joke was certainly on him. Poor Edgar, my foot. He started rumors about his brother's widow. The French perfumes she used were love potions. She and her 12 companions had formed a coven. A coven. In the days when witchcraft was in flower, Watson, witches and their familiars banded together in unholy groups of 13, which were called covens. Lastly, Edgar maintained that the unborn child could not have been conceived by his dead brother. Uh, that sounds fairly logical, uh, under the circumstances. Furthermore, Edgar claimed that no mortal had fathered the child, that it was the offspring of the devil himself. In proof of this contention, he pointed out hoof prints under Louise's window. In short, the unfortunate lady was tried as a witch, and English justice being, shall we say, slightly biased in those days, she was sentenced to be hung by the neck until dead. <laughs> well, it's dashed unfair if you ask me. After which she was buried at the crossroads beneath the Roman tower with a stake through her heart and a great stone over the grave to make sure she didn't return from it. A lot of primitive nonsense. I wonder. At any rate, during the last fortnight, some person or persons seemed to have removed that stone, and some rather curious, not to say frightening, phenomena have occurred. You mean there's, there's been some mischief afoot? It amounts to more than mischief, Watson. And the present head of the House of Fenwick seems to feel the safety of his firstborn is threatened, and that this danger should reach its peak tonight, which is All Hallows' Eve. Yes, here we are. This is our station. And that gentleman waiting over there beside the wagonette with the pair of handsome cobs is undoubtedly Sir Lionel, the present master of Fenwick Hall. Tuck this rug uh, over your knees, gentlemen. It's a longish drive to the hall, and the wind across the moors has turned uncommon cold. Thank you, Sir Lionel. I'll admit it, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I was greatly relieved when I received your telegram, saying I could expect you. Oh? Have there been any further disturbances since you mailed your letter to me? That there have, Mr. Holmes. The church bell is tolled at odd hours last night and the night before. Several swans on Fenwick Mere were found drowned. Drowned? Swans? I know it sounds incredible, Dr. Watson, but Rogers, my gamekeeper, assures me they were drowned. Furthermore, a young goat was discovered dragged to the foot of the witch's grave, its throat all torn and bleeding, as if it had been killed by a wolf or some ferocious dog. All unpleasant occurrences, Sir Lionel, but not necessarily supernatural. Well, that's what I keep telling my wife and that, oh, that stupid old nurse of hers. But she continues to be more and more terrified. And I must say, when old Willie was found to be missing this morning, I really began to worry. Old Willie? Uh, he's the gatekeeper, Mr. Holmes. Uh, lives in this little stone lodge beside the entrance to our property. He's tended that gate for over 50 years. Never leaves it, night or day, except to come up to the hall for a Christmas party and my birthday. 
Well, maybe uh, the monotony finally got the best of him, eh, Holmes, and he decided to wander off. Well, he, he could wander very far, Dr. Watson. Old Willie was a cripple. He managed to hobble a few feet with the aid of his crutch, but that's the curious part of the story. Willie was missing, but his crutch was there where he left it every night, propped up against the foot of his bed. By Jove. Was anything else missing? Any clothing, uh, overcoat, shoes, money, provisions of any sort? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. Wherever Willie went, he went in his nightshirt. Not even his carpet slippers are gone. Nothing was missing? Nothing at all? Well, as a matter of fact, one object has disappeared with him. The old broom with which Willie swept the leaves away from the gates. My wife's nurse set up a typical Irish ululation when she heard about it. Insisted old Willie had ridden off on it to join the witch's Sabbath tonight. She always hated him because he makes her get out of the cart and open the gates himself, herself, when she goes marketing for my wife. Oh, typical household feud, eh, Holmes? Well, I tried to reason with the ignorant old fool, but she kept moaning and groaning that she'd always known Willie had the evil eye. Uh, she's managed to frighten my poor wife nearly into hysterics. My wife is Irish too, Mr. Holmes, and I must say they place more credence in these old wives' tales than we do here. Uh, she says it's the curse of the House of Fenwick being visited upon us. A curse of the House of Fenwick? Well, it seems a certain Lady Fenwick, uh, born Louise de Lombard. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Holmes already told me about her. Uh, hung as a witch uh, and buried at the foot of the Roman Tower. Uh, that's right. Uh, well, it seems that when the hangman came to place the noose around her neck, she turned to my great-great uh, something or other grandfather, who had the bad judgment to be standing nearby, she turned to him and laughed. <laughs> but my dear brother Edgar, a silken robe, que c'est charmant. What a charming necklace it will make, eh? You think this is the end of Louise de Lamballe, but you are so very mistaken. You do not let me live to have my first child, and so I say I will not let your first child live. Eh, not the first child of any of the great house of Fenwick. Louise shall come back, and she shall come back and take them all. <laughs> Has, uh, has she managed to live up to her threats, Sir Lionel? Well, certainly not all of the eldest children of our house have met an untimely death. But a rather high percentage have been stillborn, and several have succumbed shortly after birth. One was drowned by a swan in uh, Fennec Mere. Oh, the wind is rising. Well, we're approaching High Tower Tor, Dr. Watson. The wind is always stronger here. How ghastly the Roman ruins look in this moonlight. Uh, when we reach the next bend in the road, we shall be opposite the witch's grave. Oh, there's a curious strip of mist lying across the road. Oh, easy, e easy, Phoebe, easy, blue boy. What in blazes has got into the horses? Something seems to have frightened them. Oh, great Scott. What's that? There's something white over there in the bracken. Hell, hell. Rein in the horses, Sir Lionel. I think our investigation may begin here. Come along, Watson. Help. Someone help. I am a dying. Well, that white thing, it's, it's, it's moving. It's, it's, it's crawling along the ground. Put up your revolver, Watson. It's a man. He's badly hurt. What's he doing all in white? That's a nightshirt, Watson. Oh. By Jove! It's old Willie! but his face is all black. So are his hands. Willie, what's that stuff you've got on your skin? Uh, it's the salve, the flying salve. She gave me so I could fly here to Hightower Heath. We flew here, me and me broomstick. We flew all the way. Good Lord, he's out of his head. 
He's delirious. Yes, he's in a bad way. Take his pulse, Watson. Here you are, old boy. Take a swig out of my flask. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm frozen cold. Been cold ever since I put on the salve. She said it was because we was flying so high. Who was she? The witch what was her name? The witch, of course. What did she look like? Oh, that I couldn't rightly say. She was wearing a veil over her face and standing in the moonlight at the foot of the bed. I'd been asleep when she called to me. Wake up. Wake up, Willie Malloy. You? Who be ye? Someone who can make you dance. Someone who can make you fly. You've always wanted to dance, haven't you, Willie? They're giving a dance tonight around my grave. Here, take this jar of ointment. Cover yourself with it, Willie. Cover your old broomstick. It will make you fly. I'd like that. Then, Free like a bird. I'd like to fly. Then put on the ointment. I'll wait for you outside. We'll fly to the tower and dance together around my grave. I'd do anything if it could make me walk, ma'am. I'd dance with the devil himself. You may just do that, Willie. <laughs> I did like she told me, sir. I covered myself in me broom. And first thing I know, I got lighter and lighter. Up and up I went. Up in the clouds. And the next I know, I was here on the heath. Watching them dance. The little people, they was dancing around in a circle. But it made me dizzy to watch them. So I crept under a bush and went to sleep. This morning I woke up cold and sick. I tried to get back on my broomstick and fly home. But the magic was gone. I couldn't fly. And I couldn't walk. Poor old boy. Hello. His pulse. It stopped. Ho Holmes, give me, give me the brandy. Willie, Willie, don't give up now. I'm afraid he has, Watson. Yes, he's dead all right. Dead of exhaustion and exposure. Dead of narcotic poisoning. And one of the most despicable tricks I've ever encountered. Mr. Holmes, uh, what do you mean? I shall be able to answer that question more accurately, Sir Lionel, after I've had a chance to analyze the ointment that's smeared on the broomstick that's lying beside the body. Bring it along, Watson. Careful you don't smear it on your clothes. <laughs> Good Lord! What was that? Well, the moon's rising above the hill. How white the crossroads look. Yes, this is where the witch is buried. Look here. All around the heather, it's trampled down in a large ring. Great Scott! There was a dance here last night. And look at these footprints in this damp spot. Uh, small footprints. All small. No wonder Willie said he saw the little people. <laughs> Here we are, gentlemen. This is uh, Fennec Hall. If you'd be uh, good enough to pull the, the bell, Dr. Watson. Oh, certainly. Place sounds hollow, eh, Holmes? Is that you, Lionel? Rachel, my dear. Uh, I've brought Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Thank heaven for that. It's time we had someone with some intelligence to bring order into this hysterical household. Gentlemen, this is Rachel Conway, my cousin. Uh, she used to keep house for me before my marriage, and she very kindly consented to return while my wife was having her baby. And a good thing I came back. She hasn't stepped foot out of her bed since the child was born. She won't even try. Maybe she might if you'd go away where you belong. Oh, that'll do, Nanny. <laughs> what, what, what's that? That horrible stench. They're both in the nursery with the baby, both Nanny and Lady Fenwick. 
She has had her bed brought downstairs, Lionel. They've been burning powders and drawing magic circles around the crib all afternoon. It'll be a wonder if the child isn't suffocated. Sure, and something's got to be done to protect the poor little one's soul from the ghosts and ghoulies. His father won't give him a proper Christian christening, so it's up to his old nanny to protect him from the witches. You seem to be an expert on witchcraft, Nanny. Sure I am that. My part of Ireland is alive with them. You say a child is in particular danger till he's been christened? Oh, everyone knows that, Holmes. Ah, uh, she's begged and she's begged his lordship to let the village priest sprinkle him with holy water and read the words over the boy. But no, he must wait till the bishop gets back from Scotland. The Phoenix have always been christened by the bishop. You keep out of it. If it hadn't been for your backing him up, they'd never have quarreled over it at all. At all. That's enough, Nanny. Mr. Holmes isn't interested in family bickerings. No. At the moment, I'm more interested in finding out what this stuff is on the handle of this broomstick. And discovering which one of the women in this household has been visiting the witch's grave. How can you tell that, Mr. Holmes? Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I shall search the room of every woman in this house. Whatever for, Mr. Holmes? It was a woman who lured Willie to the crossroads last night. It was a woman we heard laughing on the moors tonight. No one can wander over the heath without collecting evidence of it on his or her clothing. Mud on the shoes, bracken on the coat or cloak. By the way, Sir Lionel, do you suppose I could speak to your wife a moment before she goes to sleep? In fact, she cannot. She's asleep already. Really? I'd have thought she'd be too concerned over her son's safety to doze off tonight of all nights. I gave her a sleeping potion. I put it into her tea at supper. Yeah, I, I see. Uh, you said the nursery was down here on this first floor, I believe. Uh, that's right, Dr. Watson. Uh, the only upstairs room with a fireplace is the master's suite. Uh, you know how susceptible children are to cold. But surely if the child is in any danger, well, it would be better to move him off the ground floor. What he's in danger from can come through locked doors. It can come down chimneys. He'll be in danger till he's christened. That's when the witches try to snatch him before they're proper baptized. It's the soul they're after, not the body. Nanny, one more word of that nonsense and I'll ship you back to Ireland. Now, get back to your mistress where you belong. Sure, and if it's back to Ireland, I'm a-going, she's going with me, and don't you forget it. She's a fool, Lionel. You should have got rid of her long ago. Yeah, uh, but poor Lady Fenwick was so homesick, I, I didn't have the heart to, to take her nurse from her. Good heavens, what am I thinking of? Cook has laid out supper for you gentlemen on a table in front of the fire in the library. I'll fetch some hot coffee. Thank you, but we've no time to waste on food. Holmes, I'm starved. Very well, Watson. Suppose you make us some sandwiches while I set up our chemical equipment. If you can arrange it, Sir Lionel, I should like to have the use of a room not too far from the nursery. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Um, you may take over the gun room. Uh, it's directly opposite. Hmm, yes. And if you smell any further curious odors, don't be alarmed. I imagine we may be able to give Nancy's powders and potions a run for their money. You may turn out the Bunsen burner, Watson. Now. Let's see what we've discovered in that confounded salve. Hog's fat, water, hemlock, aconite, blood, probably from a rat or bat that I can't determine without a more powerful microscope, sink foil, deadly nightshade, and soot. Yeah, a fine collection of poisonous ingredients, eh, Holmes? <laughs> the interesting thing, Watson, is that they're all well-known ancient poisons, the aconite and deadly nightshade, or belladonna, being particularly potent. Belladonna is, of course, a violent de deliriant. It's no wonder poor old Willie thought he was flying. Yes, Watson, the salve that was used to anoint Willie and his broomstick was undoubtedly medieval witch's formula for flying ointment. Oh, you don't really believe in things like that. No, Watson, I... 
I don't think Willie actually flew from here to the Roman Tower, but he was undoubtedly under the impression that he had done so. He was probably transported in a cart or carriage. But why would anyone want to, to poison Willie, take him uh, across the moors and, and then leave him to die? I don't think the intent was to harm him as much as it was to frighten him. Unfortunately, whoever took him to the witch's grave was frightened off when they found they weren't alone. When, when they found they weren't alone? Exactly. The little people were more than they'd bargained for. Holmes, there are times when... Uh... Quiet, Watson. Someone opened a door upstairs. Turn out the lamp. That's right. I, I didn't hear anything. Yes. Someone's coming along the upper hallway. I thought my remark about searching the rooms tomorrow might lead to something. Well, why warn anyone if, if you intended to search their belongings? To save us the trouble of searching, Watson. If any of the women in this household have anything to hide, you may depend on that they'll try to get rid of it tonight. Someone's coming down the stairs. Yes, judging by her step, it's a woman. She's heading for the library. You stay here, Watson. Keep your eyes on the nursery door. I'm going to follow her. I would throw those papers in the fireplace, Miss Conway. Mr. Holmes. If you will allow me to take one look at them. I'd rather die. Very well. Suppose I tell you what these envelopes contain. Some early photographs of Sir Lionel and letters from him. But they're not love letters. You must believe they're not. I do believe it, Miss Rachel. You were, are, in love with him. The affection has never been returned. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But Lionel doesn't know how I feel. He doesn't know I've kept his letters. Please, please don't tell him. It would kill me if he found out. I have kept many secrets in my time, Miss Rachel. I believe there is room for one more. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. And for goodness sake, go out to the kitchen and make yourself a cup of tea. And make some for Watson, too. I will, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I will. Holmes, Holmes, come quickly. The old nurse slipped out of the nursery. She's gone upstairs. Calm yourself, Watson. We'll catch her on the way back. Yes, I wonder what she'll bring with her. Strange how old houses seem to creak at night. Quiet, Watson. Yes, she's coming back. She's reached the head of the stairs. She's stopped two steps down. So that's what her little game is, isn't it? Very interesting. Ver yes, here she comes down the rest of the way. Strike a match, Watson. Now then, Nanny, what's that you've got in your hands? A ball of twine and a pair of shoes. Why not? My lady's shoes it is. I forgot to shine them. So you did. Muddy, aren't they? Let me see them. You go to the devil. <laughs> I'll be. Yes, Watson, as I suspected. Lady Fenwick wasn't as bedridden as she wanted people to believe. Sometime during the last 24 hours, she's been out on the moors. That red clay on her boots is rather prevalent at the foot of High Tower Hill. You mean, you mean she's been pretending to be the ghost? Holmes, Holmes, it's midnight, the witching hour. of heaven stay up there don't come downstairs sir lionel if you value your neck bridget uh mr holmes what's happening down there light the lamp watson that's better now sir lionel if you'll investigate the second step from the top good lord a piece of twine stretched across the stairs a trip rope you were supposed to fall downstairs and break your neck oh no lionel she didn't mean any harm Nanny only wanted to frighten you, so you'd let the priest christen the baby. You mean that's the reason she gave you, Lady Fennec? Bridget, 
What, what in heaven's name has been going on here? Oh, darling, I am so frightened. When Nanny told me about the cures and the witch's stone being gone, I didn't want anything to happen to the baby. I didn't know Willie would die. Oh, I only thought she wanted to get even with him. Oh, I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean any harm. Wow, I'll say that was a spine chiller, Dr. Watson. Yeah, appropriate for Halloween, don't you think? But, but why did old Nanny want to stir up, want to stir up so much trouble? Well, uh, she hated the Moors, uh, she hated Willie, and she hated Sir Lionel. She was a thoroughly warped personality. She, she wanted to make trouble for everybody. Some people are like that, you know. Holmes suspected her immediately, of course, when he smelled the, the, the hocus-pocus powder uh, she'd been burning in the nursery. Uh, he knew that she must have made that flying ointment that was responsible for Willie's death. But what about the missing gravestone and the drowned swans, ringing church bells, and the little people? <laughs> well, before I explain all that, well, suppose we show our gratitude to the people who make this program possible? A very sound idea. Friends, Petri took time to bring you good wine. That Petri family really knows how to make good wine, and it's no wonder. They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you just can't beat the Petri family because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Oh, very good wine. And, and now, um, as to the question about the, uh, about the gravestone, the swans, and the church bell, <clears throat> who is it plays Halloween pranks in this country, Mr. Harris? You mean children. <laughs> right. Holmes realized that when he saw the size of the footprints at High Tower Heath. Well, I'm blessed. <laughs> I hope so, I'm sure. Uh, and now, uh, as to next week's story, I, I'm going to tell you about a letter that caused a great blustering booty of a man to go to his death. What did the letter contain, Dr. Watson? Just five little dried up orange pits. <laughs> Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is your announcer, Cy Harris, saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our St. Louis Park studio in the heart of charming Minnesota. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.